What's up, everyone? This is the Go Long Show with Jim Monas. I'm Tyler Dunn, and we're supported on the podcast by Fatty Beer Company. Make sure you get on in. Orchard Park, Hamburg, downtown, Lancaster, Tonawanda. If you're in western New York, I'm sure there's a fatty 10, 15 minutes away from wherever you are. And Jim, I already had to pour one for this episode. It's been it's been a day. Actually drinking a little Guinness here. Very rare Guinness. It Sometimes you have a beer in your fridge and you have no idea where it came from. I have no idea where this came from. And we don't really <clears throat> have a lot in the fridge. So I probably should investigate a little bit. I I don't know. It could be a trap of some sort. Tyler, it's that time of year when you don't know what beer is going to hit you the certain days. It's, you know, you can't predict it. I was yeah. never a big Guinness guy when I was in my prime drinking, but sometimes it hit. Sometimes it hit. Well, it was definitely uh, a witching hour of epic proportions tonight with the kiddos. So they're 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 going to sleep over my shoulder as I speak. Potty training sunny has been a success, actually. You know, it's been really Congrats. good. Congrats. You know, four or five days of ripping the band-aid off, saying, All right, we if all you've got to go, you're just gonna go, buddy. And uh, we've turned a corner. But at night, at night, we're going with the pull up undie combo because right. You know, he wants the undies, but he's not prepared quite yet to make that plunge. So, you know, kind of weaning him in. Perhaps that's the segue. Perhaps that's an Atlanta Falcons situation here. We we signed Kirk Cousins. <laughs> I didn't even prepare for that. <laughs> signed Kirk oh, Cousins yeah. to uh to a record breaking contract, and then we drafted Michael Penix. So all ba- bases covered there. Uh, but yes, we had Jay Skursky on earlier in the week to dissect everything Buffalo Bills and we wanted to get Jim on here to recap the NFL draft in full. Um there's a million different directions to take this. But first of all, what what's going on in your world? Uh, how's everything going? Tyler, everything's good. I'm laughing thinking about you're like just draft um you're just draft crazy, like weary and you're just we, we, enough of the draft. Like you can't do any more of the Falcons had the worst pick in the history or whatever it is of the day we have to go potty training going we're going at all we're going all different i think i would but take no, sunny seriously. just shit in his diaper 12 times over over no, the uh exactly. the influencers and the flag football propaganda and what the nfl draft has become it, it's a spectacle beyond spectacles and it's just brutal to i'm glad the viewership went down day two and day three maybe the nfl will listen to people and say you know what we don't want to turn this into this uh, uh i don't even know what you'd call it not really a concert they're trying to appeal to everybody in every possible way just get just give me the philly and new yorkers pissed off at hometown teams at radio city music hall it's i hate what the draft has become it's become it i realized it the other day because we were pretty excited for this draft talking about it we knew, I, to me, it was pretty uneventful. We'll talk about, you know, the every, it's t- kind of talked out, but we'll go through some stuff only because we've done so much with these quarterbacks for our loyal listeners. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't blown away by this draft. I was more trying to wait to see if you were going to put out any draft grades. Uh, you know, since you're Mr. Mock Draft now, I didn't know if you're going to do draft grades. I, th- I saw people giving draft day one grades, day two grades, oh, day oh. three grades. And I was trying to figure out is a draft three grade equivalent to a seven round mock. Mm. What has more, probably the, 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 probably the grade has a better chance of being accurate than a seven round mock, you know, as far as at least then you're going off guys, you know, were picked by the team. But I'm just saying, I can't get over what it goes. It all ties back to the draft has just become this mocks and grades and concerts and Eminem. I don't know. I, the GMs now, Tyler, I've noticed the Brad Holmes draft room wearing jerseys. Uh, the GMs are now appearing on the Pat McAfee show a lot more than coaches. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, if you're on there, you're. That's where the cool kids hang out. It seems to be where they're getting funneled uh, these days, but uh, all good stuff. I think it's good publicity for the GMs who do work hard 
to put these yes. rosters together. And it's good that they're getting some limelight. Um, get a chance. I did to enjoy Brandon Bean's spot on McAfee. I thought there was uh, some information gleaned there. But I will laugh at, at when they show these war rooms on okay, the so, broadcast and yes. the pick is made and everybody just claps for themselves. All 32 teams. I, I sure as hell hope you didn't do that. We might have to go back and find the footage of Jim Onis with Doug Whaley and the scouts when a pick is made. The Sammy Watkins trade. Now, there is some excitement involved there. I can I can see being so being celebratory, perhaps. But like the nonchalant third round pick offensive tackle from Northwestern and everybody's clapping. They know the camera's on everybody's in the suits, you know, Bob McGinn in his column, he poked fun at it. Cause he, he knows a lot of people in these rooms, you know, guys who have been scouting forever, you know, they're on the road and their sweats, you know, picking up McDonald's with just grease and grime and just slobs. And then the TV cameras on, Got to put the suit on and clap for that offensive tackle from Northwestern. It it used to cause for awkward moments, depending on who you were standing by or next to. You had to very you had to be ready to celebrate. How are you going to do it for the Sammy Watkins trade? It, that was a trade up, which that was one where okay, it happened. That's one where you do get excited. You are you know because that's one that isn't you know you stand up, you're pretty excited. We kept it to, I tried to keep it to a golf clap. I knew the cameras, you know, I'm not going to lie. I knew the cameras are on and I was terrified of it because I kept thinking I, this, this is the first draft. I was director of personnel. And I was like, if this thing blows up, I can't, we can't be fist pumping going chest pump. We can't do Brad. Brad Holmes has been hitting on picks, but I didn't feel confident enough to bang tables and wear jerseys. We weren't he there can yet. Pull it off. I feel like Brad Holmes, Dan Campbell's within character to be that animated. Right. I mean, because they go over the top with it. It's like, this is who we are. Positional villains, Dan Campbell jerseys. It's it's the forced slow clap. You know, maybe their eyes are bobbing over to a camera. So then they know or the TV screen, they know they're on. And it's just Howie Roseman fist bumping Tom Donahoe-esque. It's tough. I always say it's everybody shaking hands and the next day they're possibility of getting fired firing each other right to their face hey why I mean, is it like that i don't think a lot of fans understand why that is the case so like you and doug were all let go that day after the draft and there might have been bills fans thinking that's strange like they just drafted these players and they're let go but that that's kind of how it works everywhere isn't it jim it is that's the yearly cycle in scouting personnel GMs, coaches, I mean, uh, just GM scouts. They're just tied together to start the year now because now you start, you, you take a week to kind of breathe. Now you start draft meetings. You start going down the, to the national and blessed those scouting meetings. You start those right away. So yeah, this is the time of year where things happen and it, it's the part of the business, Tyler. We've talked about it a lot. It, it's not, it's a crazy thing. You don't get a real chance to, to celebrate sometimes your work but I think that is why you see all these people in the draft room teams like to bring all the scouts in obviously for their information but in all honesty Tyler all the information's in front of you on your laptop it's right you don't need the scouts there it's a chance for the scouts to be there to come together celebrate be around the team celebrate the picks hopefully renew your contract I can remember with the Saints, you know, you would get the day after the, you know, you sign all the undrafted guys. You have about two more days and before you fly home as an area scout or a personnel guy, and you get your contract extension possibly right there. Mm -hmm. And I used to try to see how fast I could open it and sign it and give it back without even looking at it. it I didn't care what the number was. I wasn't looking at anything. I just knew it was an extra year. I was signing and signing it back get on my flight back to Charleston, South Carolina and keep that life rolling as an area scout. A question you're never supposed to ask anybody, but I'll ask it. Like how much does an area scout for the saints make? So I think I would be interested now, Tyler, to see, I don't know what team, what people are making right now. I can tell you this. I would think a first year scout right now. I think I would, I would think on the, I would think it'd be around 70 or 80 a year mm -hmm. for a first year scout right now. 
So we really shouldn't poke too much fun and mock because it's like these, it, when it comes to the area scouts and the grinders and the people doing all of the legwork on all of these prospects. I mean, we do, I know we're having fun, but we have the utmost respect for those people. And this is kind of a Super Bowl. I mean, this is when it all kind of culminates. And this is why you hear Brian Gutekinds and Brandon Bean and Chris Ballard and Brett Veach. I mean, all these GMs, they, they thank their scouts for all of the work they put in. That's the first thing you're going to hear from a GM because those area scouts are sacrificing yeah. their lives, 60, 70% of their lives. No, it was wild. And it's appreciated as a scout when you hear, hear your GM mention your name or just the scouts in general. It does go a long way because you just, your families, your families invest too. Your families are following the drafts. Only families. I, I don't know how families used to do it. I, I don't, I don't know how people would pay attention to these drafts. But I was thinking about this with what we were talking about with like Brandon Bean or whoever's on the Pat McAfee show right now. And if you notice, these GMs look pretty relaxed. They're having a good time. Just think about when you finished your school year. That is literally how <laughs> they all feel right now. It is the most freeing. Like we're undefeated. We got every player we wanted. Couldn't believe they were there. We all heard it. But it is true. You feel that kind of relief. And just you free is the word I use. You just feel free for about at least a month, as long as there's no injuries at one of these rookie camps or mini camps, you know, but you do feel free for like your mind even too. And you can just see it the way they, they sit in the chair differently. They, they're all smiling. They're not all serious. Like we are, we are going to get, it, it goes from, we are going to get, you know, smart and tough players that love football you know, all the time, blah, blah, blah. Now it's, oh, we were having a, yeah, I was calling so-and-so. He called me, we were trying to trade up and they're all laughing now. It's, a, I, it, it's true though. All that is true. It all happens. And case in point, during Brandon Bean's uh, press conference to wrap it up, Joe Shane called him like as a prank. Like he knew he was doing a press conference. It's called him to mess with him. And Bean's like, oh, that, that jackass, he does this all the time. I, <laughs> right. School's out, have some fun. I remember talking to Josh Lucas, who was with the Bears during, um, it was his first draft in Chicago. It, it may have been my second one in Buffalo. But, you know, we'd work together as area scouts with the Saints, and we said, all right, this is our chance. We got to try to pull off a trade. Like, somehow, we got to try to do a trade today. You know, we were, we were trying, we were, we were working the cell phone a little bit, but we we had one close. I think we were, I think we had one close one time, but we never actually did one. Point being, it happens. You, you do want to, you do, there are certain people you're comfortable do, you know, going to do deals with. So when it comes to the dramatics, it doesn't get any more dramatic than what the Atlanta Falcons did. Eighth it's, overall. Okay. Nobody saw it coming. Maybe we should have seen it coming to an extent. I, I'm, I'm thinking back to uh, my conversation with Terry Fontenot. He said, he said it then uh, when it comes to the quarterback position, Quote, we've got to get the quarterback position right, and there's a lot of good options. Free agency, draft, there's a lot of good options, and I'm really confident because, man, we have a stud staff, and he rattled off, you know, the pro department, people working in the uh, collegiate department, and saying they're going to get all these bases covered. They've got all these options. They're feeling really good. He's really laid back. He's really happy. Looking back, I mean, that Kirk Cousins deal, Imagine they were pretty close to the goal line on that one at the NFL Combine. And he was right. I mean, they they covered both bases. They paid the big money for Kirk Cousins. Tell the world we're in win-now mode. We're going for it. With the top 10 pick, you can get any defensive player you want. You can get Roma Dunze. Put him with Drake London, Kyle Pitts. Who else did this sign? Uh, Darnell Mooney. Traded for Rondell Moore. I mean, could have gone a lot of different routes and they take Michael Penix Jr. in the top 10. It stuns the public. It stuns people in the NFL. Ryan Poles laughed. He was asked at his press conference, the Bears GM, because he's picking right after Atlanta. Like, were you surprised Atlanta took Penix? And he, he chuckled. You, you very rarely see GMs chuckle um, when it comes to other GMs decisions. And Kirk Cousins is pissed off. I think we both know that. A lot of people know that by now. He's not happy. There are a million different ways to look at this. 
Um, I'm really trying to view it with an open mind. Uh, but first, I want to get your take, Jim. What did you think about that selection? It's been like talked about the shot heard around the world, it feels like. And, and the funny thing is, it's the takes have been all over. So I think to keep it simple for me, the shocking part for me is that the owner was good with the decision because it's such a commitment to basically four to five years down the road to this front office and coaching staff that you just committed the, the money to the quarterback, to Kirk Cousins. You committed that money to him. Now you're going to commit the eighth pick of the draft to the future starting quarterback. Uh, that is That is a long commitment question I would have would be that we don't know is how fearful they are of the Kirk Cousins injury which would be fair I do not hate the thought of for Terry Fano and Raheem Morris I don't hate this thought process to draft Penix if they believed in Penix the steam for this blew up the first time I thought Tyler things were getting a little strange is when the whole brass went from Atlanta out to Washington that's a cross country that that's an effort trip. Just you can, there's certain times I know that, you know, when you see the whole brass going, that's, that's real. Hmm. Like Terry Pagula and Sean McDermott weren't coming to Deshaun Kaiser's um, workout that Doug Willie and I went to, they were coming to Mahomes, Trubisky and Watson. Okay. Point being is, and, and then that trip from Atlanta all the way to Washington, obviously is it's insane. So you know there's something going on. There is interest in Penix, but the general thought was second round or trade up in the first, wherever. Point being is they had their conviction. I love it. I, I'm all for having the conviction. I just can't get over the owner signing off on this whole thing. And Cousins, now you have, now you have your starting quarterback not trusting your head coach and GM right off the bat. So there, he's pretty much those anything out of their mouth at this point, it's going to be tough. What happens when he doesn't play well? Is, is Taylor Heineke going to remain the number two this year? And are they going to shelf Penix just to get it out of the mix? So you don't have the fans chanting for Penix as soon as Cousins has that bad game that's going to happen. We all know. So that way Penix, either way they would chant for Penix over Heineke, obviously, but I'm just saying it, it, it gets out the expectations that Penix is going to play this year over Cousins. That that will take care of itself if they keep Heineke number two, obviously. But I'm just shocked at, at the, the owner. That's all. I don't, I don't hate the pick. The decision does not make sense. Um, I, I shouldn't – you – they should not fire Terry Fontenot or, or Raheem Morris at least until Michael Penix's career is over. I just don't know. I mean, I feel like you should just tie them all together at this point. All right. What are your thoughts? I haven't heard your, I haven't heard your thoughts. That was a great breakdown. I, to me, I think there's two very different ways to look at the decision to draft Michael Penix Jr. And there is the cold, hard football decision, which is smart. And and I get it. Michael Penix is, is older, but 24 hey. And even if Kirk Cousins plays the next three years, he's still right, 27 is old ish, but the way the rules are set up, the way quarterbacks are protected, I don't necessarily have as big of a problem with that. He, he is older and he's going to be itching to play. And, you know, if you're looking at it through that cold and calculated, see Kirk Cousins contract through play Michael Penix. It's not that crazy. I mean, and Kyle Smith, the assistant GM, if you listen to his press conference, and I, I'd encourage people to do it. I mean, he is as old school football as it gets. You heard Terry Fano describe him in the story we had where he could just call Kyle Smith or Kyle Smith would call him any hour of the day and just start talking about a player he was watching on film and just send him cut ups. Hey, take a look at this guy. I mean, he is. Um, it's it's kind of dumb to say a scout or a personnel person or a coach is obsessed with the game, but there definitely are different levels. And and I got the sense he he really is. His dad obviously was with the with the Bills, with the Chargers. So he's grown up in this game. 
And the way he described it, it, it was very long winded. And he even used that word, you know, after he kind of explained the whole five year window, wanting to be set at the position for five years. He said, quote, I know it's long winded. It's going back in time. It's an unsettling feeling sitting there in 21. I'll never forget sitting there with Terry and being like, what's our future? What's our plan for the future? How are you going to solidify down the road? It's not just about this year or next year. It's about five years minimum and always trying to find that option. And through the draft, it just didn't happen naturally. You don't want to put yourself in the position where you have to force something. You want it to happen naturally. And in this situation, we went out and got a guy that we believe in. We're sitting in the draft. We let our board speak to us. There was a guy there at the position. So now we feel really good at five years minimum. We're good. We don't have to worry about that position. So in that sense, Jim, I think you have to give the Falcons a hell of a lot of credit because go back in time to 2021. That draft class is not by you. I mean, you could kind of see that there were some red flags with a lot of these guys, but heralded as a talented draft. And you had Trevor Lawrence, one, Zach Wilson, two, Trey Lance, three, and not just three. You had San Francisco trading three first round picks to get him. And then Atlanta had their choice. They could have taken Justin Fields. They could have taken the hometown quarterback. They could have taken Mac Jones out of Alabama. They're in SEC country. Their scouting department looked at it. I think in retrospect, wisely, if you want a quarterback that can operate in the pocket and process and do what you want to do, it probably wouldn't have worked out, I guess, if they would have taken a quarterback then. You go to 2022, looking at these unsettling feelings. Let's see, they were picking eighth. And they took Drake London. I mean, that would have been Kenny Pickett, Malik Willis, and the gang. So that's that's not a draft unless you know Brock Purdy's going to be a stud. And then and then last season, God, they all kind of blur together, don't they, Jim? Yes, I'm. I'm glad you're doing this because I, if you just do it off the top of your head, I can't remember. Bijan Robinson, obviously number eight for the Falcons, but I mean, a quarterback wasn't going to come naturally to them there. Will Levis was the next quarterback taken in the second round at 33. So you're not in range for Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, Will Anderson, or I'm sorry, Anthony Richardson, Will Anderson went three to the Texans. Um, so, I mean, he kind of has a point there where it's this really important position. You don't want to force it. And you've been there now for a long time. If you're Terry Fontenot, you, you've gone through Arthur Smith. Now you've got Raheem Morris. Uh, part of me gets it. Right. And yeah, you've got the financial resources. Uh, Arthur Blank, he made it clear, you know, maybe they weren't in on Lamar Jackson a year ago, but money is no problem right now. And at one point in our conversation, Terry picked up that bag of Skittles and said, if you tell Arthur, like, you know, 10 of these things are every worded, it will get us a Super Bowl and that costs X amount of dollars. He'll, he'll do whatever. And he did. I mean, they went on paid Kirk Cousins, they went on drafted Michael Penix. They've so I I'm okay with all of that, honestly. Mm -hmm. Purely football, cool with it. But it's a human game, Jim. And now Kirk Cousins and Michael Penix are sharing a quarterback room. And Kirk Cousins is going into a new city with a new team and a new coaching staff. You just alluded to this, and he's going in unhappy, right? Like he's he's not thrilled. This isn't Aaron Rodgers, Jordan Love. I mean, Aaron Rodgers was flirting with retirement. Um, Jordan Love was much younger. It, it it made sense contractually to do what they were doing, Green Bay. It's not like they just handed Aaron Rodgers all this money. Um, it was bold. And also, it was in the 20s. Like, they're picking Jordan Love at the end of the first round versus eight overall. So it's going to be awkward in that quarterback room. The city of Atlanta... Are they going to be supporting Kirk Cousins if the Falcons are, I don't know, two and four, three and five? If they're if they're 500, you know, if they're six and six and Kirk Cousins say he, he say he checks it down on a throw at the end of the game and they lose. And it's the kind of stuff that we have seen through Kirk Cousins' career. But the fans just gonna kind of accept it and say, you know what? No, they're gonna be called for Michael Penix. So it, day to day, week to week, month to month, year to year, that elephant is going to be in the room. And guess what? Michael Penix, 
I know he said all of the right things and he'll do whatever. Look, all of these guys are competitors. He's going to want to play. He's absolutely going to want to play. It wasn't easy for Jordan Love to sit three years behind Aaron Rodgers when Aaron Rodgers has won an MVP a couple times. So nobody knows what's happen, what's going to happen in that regard. And that is the risk for Atlanta. You are risking. Um, I mean, it's not like Kirk Cousins is going to go out there and play poorly because there's somebody else in there. I, I get, I get that. Uh, but it just seemed, it does seem like an unforced error as far as that goes, but I don't, I guess I don't feel unbelievably strongly either way. Cause I, I, I can kind of see both points of view here. If I was the Falcons, which I'm not the Falcons, I would have just taken a Dunze, right? He's could be your number two, your number three, throw him in that offense, try to win. Now you're telling us you want to win. Now you're telling us you want to win now, but it's a very important position. And if anybody knows it, Jim, it's the Falcons. It's the team that's been trotting out, you know, Matt Ryan at the end of his career to Marcus Mariota, to Desmond Ritter, right? Like Taylor Heineke. They're done doing that. Like they, they don't want to do that. So they're going to cover both of their bases to the extreme. You, you can spin it. I almost feel like you could spin it so many ways because to your point, you could spin it and say quarterbacks, the obviously the most important position in sports and they just invested as much money as they possibly could invest in that position. What's the harm in that? You have two guys that you believe in. One's older that has an injury history and an unproven history and one's young. So to that point, you can't deny if you, if you spin it that way, it makes complete sense economically. Yes. The most important position you should be investing in. The question is, are you correct? The difference is the reason you can't, we can't use green Bay as the example is that was an established relationship with a coach and Aaron Rodgers and a coach and a city and a team and they, like you said, they drafted a guy in the twenties. Rogers had a history there where maybe he was on his way out. He had had his worst year. This is all brand new. We have a new offense with a Kirk Cousins and a new offense. I mean, there's a lot of unknowns that if this offense does not click off the off the jump, if they're going through troubles, that's when this thing gets interesting real fast because those cheers for panics are coming. That's Zion Williams on the bench. The other, uh, and, I, and I, maybe my Packers timeline is is mixed up there. I'm trying to think when Aaron was kind of flirting with the retirement. It might, it might not have been that soon because he definitely was caught off guard. Wait, but that whatever. is in the 20s. Like, and there were a few signs at the end of that year before even making it to the NFC Championship game. It's a different kind of relationship at that point. I understood it. The the one other. Gotcha. What just doesn't make sense to me, Jim, is the the offense they're planning on running with Zach Robinson as offensive coordinator. And you think of what they did with the LA Rams. It, it seems like it would be, you know, not deep shots all the time. That 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 was the allure of Penix. Big arm, going deep. Zach Robinson doesn't he want to kind of like take pick, pick you apart underneath? and find the weakness, attack the weakness, work the middle of the field, short to intermediate, take the big shots when you have them, don't get me wrong, but I, I made some some movement plays, right? They did get Stafford on the move to set up some throws. I, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem like maybe this quarterback fits this system, but they could see something we don't see. I personally thought Penix does have issues with inaccurate quick game throws and on the move. I don't think he is. I know he worked out very well in impressive numbers. Straight ahead speed is good, right. but his flexibility with his arm motion and upper body is stiff. So I thought that's where he misses throws, but the down the field throws as has been talked about to death is, is true. I, for, for me, he was the second best passer in this draft down the field after Caleb Williams. I thought Caleb was number one. I thought Penix was number two, throwing the football down the field. So, yeah, I 
I don't, Tyler, they have to pair up the system. How Kirk Cousins and Penix fit the same system, you got me. You know, I started to wonder if we're going to see Penix go a little higher than anybody thinks. I guess it was three or four days before the draft, catching up with a West Coast scout who has been on Penix as close as anybody. And this scout told me that he is very polarizing on the road. And as you can remember in the Southeast, like you're around these scouts all the time. You're probably talking about these prospects. Everybody has different opinions and, and Penix, there were people who had a very strong opinion in one direction. People had a very strong di- opinion in the other direction. And he, the more he studied Penix, the closer he looked, this scout really, really liked him. And if, if people missed the story, we threw it up right before the draft. Maybe it was the day of. Here's what the scout said. I know people talk about the receivers around him in the offensive line, which is completely fair. But let's not forget, C.J. Stroud had the same thing. C.J. Stroud had a bunch of receivers a couple years back, had a couple offensive linemen, Paris Johnson, Dewan Jones. Not comparing the two of them from a player standpoint, but comparing the situations, I know some people are like, well, Michael had this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Well, C.J. Stroud had the same thing. From Penix's standpoint, what I appreciate most about Michael was his arm strength, the quickness of his release, and his accuracy. Man, I know his receivers are all really good, and I know sometimes people say that his receivers make him look better. I would argue the opposite. I think Michael had a lot of balls in very tight situations. When you look at Rome, Rome's not this separator. Jalen Polk is not this elite separator. And Jalen McMillan is an elite separator, but he was hurt for most of the year. So when you look at those two, I don't know if I would put them in the excellent separator categories. So Michael had to really throw in the tight windows, and he did that pretty effectively, in my opinion. I hadn't heard that, really. You know, it's it's a different way to look at it. You see the highlights, right? Like, you'll see two or three highlights of a receiver catching a ball deep, but you watch a full game and, and maybe it is different. I agree with a lot of that with the scout said, because for Adunze, when I was scouting him, it was almost crazy how many times he was having contested catches that ended up being not great catches because the ball was so perfectly placed. And I could not get over it. That's when it hit me that this that I couldn't wait then because I did a Dunze first before I did Penix. I was like, I can't wait to actually study Penix because these throws are crazy. The Texas game is like, that's really the game you could put on and say he's starting tomorrow. Like that's that's the stuff where get Cousins out of there and go ahead and play Penix tomorrow. That's That game was nuts. Like it was nuts what he did throwing the football. It's fascinating <laughs> because look, they could have taken the receiver. They could, they could have taken that player and they chose the quarterback. Maybe they, they saw exactly what that scout's saying. Like, no, the quarterback was the difference. Get, they had to have. They didn't want to get the best pass rusher in the draft that they pushed to the Colts for Ballard to laugh with like a wizard of That's, Oz, like behind the curtain. <laughs> Uh, that, you know, that, that's, that's a great point, draft, though. That's where it goes. No, but you're right. I mean, the Falcons, I, I just, I love the whole concept for sustained success, invest in the right position. Yeah. What a yeah. Fascinating I mean, I, I, team. You, what, what team is going to be the Jets and Falcons right now? Well, g- give like, me the quarterback over any like, defensive player. You know, I mean, 14. Picks, 14 offensive long. players. This All is where the game's day. going. Yeah. I th- th- That's the argument that I – uh, look, Dallas Turner, maybe he turns out to be Lawrence Taylor, and there's something about him that I don't know. Or the that, – That's – Latu with UCLA, and, I mean, he completely right. had to change the way he tackles with the neck issue. I don't know. I'll take medical panics. I'll take a quarterback that you have conviction on over any defensive player. To, to me, the argument mm-hmm. is offensive weapon for Kirk Cousins in the top 10 or quarterback who's going to sit behind Kirk Cousins in the top 10. Uh, wouldn't you love it's a real... Old, like, this it, is, it, sorry, go ahead, Jim. No, I was going to say, it really does prove, though, Tyler, over time how it changed 
with the position of drafting quarterback where Favre, Favre was a second round pick. Right now, Favre's first round pick. And that's where I had to learn my lesson with Mahomes because I always said that I just thought he was he was so far of like, but I thought far of a second round. It's too risky to take him too high. You know, you overthink everything. And now, you, no, no. I mean, if you see the talent and you have conviction, take him. Just take him. Because it's not just that unsettling feeling in the draft room, not liking the quarterbacks and feeling like it's a force. It's then the unsettling feeling 365 mornings out of the year going to work, talking yourself into Marcus Mariota, talking yourself into Desmond Ritter. It's they've, they've lived that, you know, they've, they've tried to get, I'm not saying Kirk Cousins is that at all. I'm just saying they, they, they want to feel good about this position in the now in the future and it's at the risk of alienating the quarterback who you just rolled out the red carpet to. It's it's a massive risk. And we're all hearing the same thing. He's pissed. Justifiably so. The message it sends to the whole locker room is it's it, it's a whole it's it's everybody. This has everybody talking. It's going to have everybody watching every throw at practice. Yeah. It's tough. It's going to be tough for Cousins. This is the guy that's hitting, you know, the, the steady doubles hitter right now, right up the middle. And then here comes, here comes Zion Williamson. Right after you get done with your nice little, uh, you know, line drive double or nice little set shot pull up jumper. And then here comes Zion just knocking everybody over with monster, <laughs> monster finish. I would really love to to sit in on those pre-draft meetings with Michael Penix. I, I wonder what those conversations were really like. And what is Penix saying? Because Penix, he knows that this team just signed Kirk Cousins. And then he sees the GM, the coach, their scouts, wanting him and sitting down with him. Like, what's going through his mind? And, and how is he kind of putting himself into that situation? And I'll take a step further. If we could ever get a real hard knocks which that hasn't existed in ages. It's overly sanitized and Roger Goodell approved and don't waste your time. That would be the, that would be the real hard knocks, the Falcons this year. Like if it was completely unfiltered, I'd want to see that in every possible way. Could we get some fields and Russell Wilson hard knocks? I don't know. For some I, reason that one has me intrigued. That, that, that just sounds terrible to me, honestly. I I, I don't want to. I really don't want to track. I, I think we we've got enough Russell Wilson in our lives, Jim. I'm I'm good. I'm good in that department. That's fine. And Justin Fields, for that matter. I think they're a. I think they're more similar than people think, personality wise. Let's just say that. I don't disagree with you. I like where heard you're some going with that. heard some interesting disagree. things on Justin Fields lately that I don't disagree. Made me raise my eyebrows in the leadership department um unrelatability department not authentic department we'll leave that there for now stay tuned to go along for further developments but yeah I, that that is uh that's the opposite of the falcons right i mean here's the falcons spending as much as they can in free agency as much as they can in the draft investing all of these resources in the quarterback and the steelers say Oh no, Sean Payton and the, the Broncos, they'll they're they'll pay you all that money. We'll give you a league minimum. And oh, Justin Fields, here's here's some chump change. We'll take him off your hands and we'll try to win with everything around the position, which tends to not work for teams. Tends to not work. It'll be a good case study. Falcons or Steelers. Right? Who has more wins? Taking these two very different approaches. Got to think NFC. I got. I guess I would take Falcons, but I like that question. That's a good one. Um, the Steelers, though, the thing you know, they're going to be so elite on defense. That's where. That's where you. You know, that's where you tend to think if they can find figure way on offense to just be functional, they're going to be in every game. They're going to be. A, they're going to be a headache, like they are every year. The games are going to be ugly. 
16, 13, two block punts. Russell Wilson will have some type of throw over his head. I, I could picture it right now. Just chaos. <laughs> but anyway, and I'm looking forward to that, though. I'm Neil O'Donnell will just come in, you know, hand off the ball a few times to Bam Morris for the hell of it. Right. All the ever, just bring them all, just all your Steeler memories, just put them all together for this. Um, what did you think of the Eagles? There, the, there's a report out there, and I like it a little bit, that the Philadelphia Eagles draft, according to the mock drafts, that how he paid, and, and that way they're always getting A's and A pluses because they're they're agree he's taking who everybody agrees with. So I saw it and it was interesting because if you study some of their first round picks, they've been a little bit, yeah, you could you could debate them, but yet they're getting A's no matter what. I thought that was funny. I I guess my point of this story or what I'm I, I think where I'm going with this is. Nick Wright's the one that talked about it, Tyler. And I, I, Nick Wright is not for everybody. I kind of like him, you know, whatever. You agree, disagree with everybody. But my point is this draft has just taken on, it's really gone a lot of different ways right now. Like we're to the point where I guess how he said that he texted Daniel Jeremiah, hey, don't put up so-and-so as the next best player, you know, because we like, you know, something like that. Yeah. Well, that would be quite disappointing for Mr. Roseman. Hmm. It seems to be just a little unethical. I just find it funny where the draft is headed. It goes back to everything, the mocks, the grades, the it's just become. I mean, imagine if all of the energy that was put into mock drafts and hypotheticals, it's draft season. I I can remember back in the day, you'd get the magazine a month before the draft, hanging out with dad on vacation, you know, breaking it down. Pro Football Weekly had the magazine out. That was about it. And it's year round now. But if all that energy that is wasted on the draft was put to good use, we'd probably be living like the Jetsons, right? We'd all be on hoverboards and time travel would exist and we'd be visiting other galaxies. And if all of the energy, all the resources spent on this grift were put to good use, what a society we'd live in, Jim, right? There. It'd be amazing, honestly. It's 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 too bad. In terms of the Eagles, I'm looking at their drafts right now, and that's a good point. I'm thinking back to, gosh, it would have been. I mean, there, there's some questionable ones. JJ Arcega Whiteside, 57 over DK Metcalf, I believe. Terry McLaurin, um, Jalen Rager, you know, t- taking him over Justin Jefferson. Granted, you got Jalen Hurts in the second round, so that worked out. And well, okay, but what about he had brought up even the defensive tackle last year, Jalen Carter, right? That was raised it, to, high, to the high heavens. It's a little, it, it, to be honest, when you he, his impact was it was okay, it wasn't like I thought that I thought he got a little overhyped, and I think that is a result of that where he was regarded as the greatest pick ever. He, he did come out of the gates pretty hot made some flash, you know, some splash plays that everybody saw on TV. But really, if you studied him all year, he never, he didn't really dominate games. Yeah, he he had the six sacks, but only 20 tackles. He finished second in the defensive rookie of the year awards, but I'm looking at all the guys taking after him, and I'd probably prefer them if you're building a team. Granted, I'm thinking back to Bob's pre-draft series and, scouts openly questioning Jalen Carter's love of the game. And that's something that we'll need to see over time, right? That that's what makes this interesting. It is, but it is, it goes back to really is how this draft has become so insane where it's tying together teams and media like this now, you know, to where you couldn't make a case for, you know, are you playing, are you trying to win the press conference? Are you trying to get that A grade? And that's where you can count, you can respect the Falcons here. They, they had to have known that they would become the they story of the 2024 draft, they and they didn't right. care. Right. Didn't care. Yeah. I, I love it. I love it. Think for yourself. How, how 
that is a really good point, bringing up Roseman and the Eagles. Man, do teams actually use mock drafts, like, seriously? I just yeah. assume that teams are – they've got their own scouting departments. They've got their own lists. They're smart enough to think for themselves. Do they do, – are there teams and GMs who do allow groupthink to kind of dull down their own creativity here? The mocks mocks aren't used – at all other than conversation pieces you always have your you like to really have your PR department pay attention to the mocks and you know you like to say hey who's there could be a name that is is a hot name that you didn't have a lot of info on possibly you just never know that's why you pay attention to them you don't do it to really think that's where guys are going to get no, you know every player. Like Tyler, every player is known way before mock drafts or even yeah. out. So it's, but it's good to know. It's good to pay attention to. It really is. It's it's good just to pay attention to them. It's another source. I I know we haven't even touched on the Buffalo Bills because we did it with Jay. I want to get we, your opinion on it, but that that's where I I respect Beans Balls in twenty twenty four because he if he just takes Keon Coleman. At 28, like, no, nobody bats an eye, right? It's it's okay. This is a the receiver they wanted. He's in the first round. He's valued as a first rounder. And to take that call from Brett Beach and the Kansas City Chiefs, to not care who they're trading up for, do your own thing, have your own beliefs, trust your own board, ignore the mocks. And the first thing he said when he came out was, yeah, we were never trading up. Like they, they were never going to trade up. And th that was such a talking point here locally. We talked about it, local radio. All, we all we all were what of course we're assuming they're at least placing the call. And if you're gonna take him at his word, they didn't even place that call. And uh receivers fall right to him at 28. They've got receiver needy teams right after them. The Chiefs, obviously, the Panthers, and then they trade down to both of those teams to take their player. That that is some independent thinking that I can really respect. Because, I mean, they're going to be questioned. Why are you sleeping with the enemy here? How could you trade with the team that you traded with back in 2017? Patrick Mahomes. Sorry, Jim. Why would you even talk to that team? Think think for yourself. Think for yourself. Take the heat. Gain, they gain a ton of value later in the draft to get the Dwayne Carters um, and, and fill out that's a whole other conversation and not taking another receiver and Philly needs, but you, you had a more quality draft overall by gaining whatever it was, 60 picks on one climb and 20 or 30 on the other. Uh, your thoughts on the bills maneuvering in this draft. So let's just go with the whole chiefs, the worthy trade for, with the chiefs and, and the chiefs taking worthy, not at all. Do you factor in, you're confident at that point when you trade back, not only you're not just trading back thinking you're getting Coleman, you have a group of players you're going to take at that point that you're so confident in. That's why you're trading back, hoping you get Coleman, but he was the top of your group that, you know, of your wish list. If Coleman was drafted, they would have had it figured out. Um, so the point being is you don't, you don't even think about the team it, that were these on the chiefs. Great. They prepared with the Chiefs for a fast receiver before. It's in the game plan. They'll figure it out. He's not Tyreek. He's different. He is legit. I do like Worthy. I do think. Now, the other thing I wanted to say is great job by, you, you're right, great job by Bean to not feel pressure to go up. The pressure was hard in Buffalo to go up, right, to go up and get a one, quote, unquote. Oh, yeah. And just like if you don't think the quarterbacks are a true one, just like those receivers aren't true ones. Like Coleman's not a true one. All the, you know, a lot of these guys aren't true ones like the neighbors, like the uh, Harrisons are. There is a gap. Um, so anyway, point being, they know it. They stayed true to it. They wanted a true big X receiver. They got it. I don't know if there's a better def definition for an X wide out right now going for where what they were looking for. Um, personally, I like Pearsall and McConkey a little bit better as pure receivers, mm -hmm. but as an X wide out, 
there's so much you can do with Coleman. He's going to fit the whole, he's fitting everything they want. So fun pick. Don't care about the 40 time. Big deal. You know, that you are, you didn't draft in the blaze by people. So it's known. It's all good. Agreed. I thought Bean did a great job addressing. I thought he was so honest with the media describing the players. I wouldn't even add to it. I'd say, go ahead and listen to your GM. He, he doesn't hide it from you. That's it's, he, he puts it out there. Utah safety's downhill, instinctive. He'll be all over the field. Trust the Bills on players like that. Um, Babbage, Al Holcomb play a big role in those evaluations for that defense. Um, they all know what they're looking for, so you got to trust it. Carter, again, plays hard, rotational, big defensive tackle, should fit right in. These, these should be good picks. Like, you can see this machine that Buffalo has. They know what they're looking for. They're they're. This is when you know you have things right. When, when you're Brandon Bean talking to Dan Morgan, right? And Dan Morgan is trading up to get in that first round. And they've worked together in Buffalo. They know each other well. Do they do they tell each other just who they want to take? Like, is, is Dan saying, oh, yeah, we, we, want, we want Leggett and... Yeah, and yeah. Says, yeah. You could say, because, like, if you're trading out of it, you could say, hey, you know, hey, we don't... Can you tell us who, you know, just let us know who you're taking or... Yeah, you can, you and you can see how those two would get kind of lumped together, very similar body frames, and maybe one team had a preference or the other. But the, the decision really was, like you just said, big X receiver versus Lad McConkey, Xavier yeah. Worthy, Ricky Pearsall. Um, and they, they're going for the full menu of options, different body types, different skill sets. Dalton Kincaid, Curtis Samuel, Khalil Shakir. Keon Coleman now, Dawson Knox. The 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 worry in we, we both praise this draft for, for different reasons. And you mentioned Cole Bishop and Dwayne Carter and getting these players. I mean, you didn't have a third round pick because of the Russell Douglas trade. So the maneuvering allows you to get 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 a player or two that you wouldn't otherwise get. I'm surprised it didn't double dip at receiver. Just just one more. Just take a stab at it. Seeing the success in Green Bay. I mean, Jim, they they did take a rugby player from overseas, Travis Clayton, ahead of Jerry Rice's son, Brenton Rice. I mean, they took somebody they didn't even see play football before over the son of the best receiver, maybe the best football player of all time. I'm just saying a double dip wouldn't have been the worst thing at receiver. Let it play out. Let it play out. I, I watch. He'll be, I he'll be my tie. That, he'll I, be he'll be Wembenyama. <laughs> that's there, there was always that. There's always a player from London, from Australia that it, it's it's a YouTube sensation that you just don't want to miss on, and you're just like, how are we taking this guy over people that have played four years at USC? To your point, however many years Rice played receiver at USC, you know, it's like, how are we taking this guy over? There's a reason. Tyler, did anybody ask? Bean, if when they traded out, if Coleman was drafted, who they were who they were prepared to draft, who they were going to take if Coleman was off the board. Shame on us no, in the media. I don't think that was asked. Yeah, I, I that because that to me is the that's where the strategy goes when you trade back you're pretty confident. You don't have just one player in mind. You have to have a group in mind. Yeah. So there I had to be that somebody been. else they were confident in. If Coleman went, there was somebody else they were confident in. It may have been Bishop. I don't know. They hmm. may have just taken Bishop. I don't know how high they had him. But that, that would be interesting to, to hear. Oh, uh, man. If, if a safety goes ahead of a receiver, then then there would have been a different reaction probably. No, I'm know. just – um, that why, that's why that question would be intriguing to see who would you have taken if Coleman was off the board? Cause you went back. There's no guarantee Coleman was going to be there. Yeah. Anyway. Well, we've got some time to dissect. Uh, no. Yeah. Those play, drafts, right. right. All these drafts. <laughs> right. Right. Well, the next thing now, here's the next thing after. So we have mock drafts and grades. The next thing we have coming now is the mini camp quarterback. That is a bust. McCarthy, whoever it'll be, throws a pick first day, bust. Or the mini camp quarterback that Drake May throws a 40-yard, you know, 50-yard rope touchdown. 
is going to start over Brissett. Yeah, that that's what's coming next. The overhyped mini camp quarterback. They're going to look good in shorts, Jim. We know that. Here we go. They're going to look. They're going to look damn good in shorts. Yeah, th- there there was so much that we didn't even touch on that I want to spend full episodes on. I mean, the New York Giants, Malik Neighbors, right? They they weren't able to move up for Drake May. They stay at six. They take the receiver over J.J. McCarthy. Not a J.J. McCarthy uh, fella myself. There, there are many who are. Going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Getting the receiver for the quarterback. When who knows if you really have that quarterback. But Daniel Jones is going to have a fair shot now. There's not going to be any questions about weapons. So at, at least that excuse will be wiped off. And maybe... That can go that that can go hard one the direction or the other. So I want to get Jim's full take on that on a future ep. I want to hear what you think about man, Drake May with the Patriots. Love me some Drake May, man. That roster though it needs some work. When does he see the field? Jim's shaking his head. I like Not it anytime soon. That's conviction. They took him. That's conviction. I like it. End it here. Is there is there a pick that you loved any round, any position? You're watching the draft. Maybe you haven't muted. Maybe you're fast forwarding through the uh, the flag football nonsense. Give me the pick you love, Jim. I love that Leggett receiver. Um, I hope he makes it. Just from you know, from being from that area, that that's a lot of pressure. Um. You know that I, he, that player, like he, he's never experienced what he's about to experience. Where he's been nothing but celebrated right now. As soon as it goes, he's about to find out how quick it doesn't matter where you're from if you don't produce. But he is such a good story. Man, he was a big boy player this year, like grown man, tough. I, he, his interviews were famous for his accent, oh, yeah. you know, from his country, from being down. And I, I love that because. You know, I lived down there for so long that it just, I loved hearing that. It just made me think about living back there. So I'm pulling for him. An off-season goal is is to uh, track down Xavier Leggett and see if we can go wild hog hunting together. I think that'd be fun. You know, maybe take go long on a little trip down there and hunt some hog, tie him up, cook him up. I, I really don't know the process of hog hunting, but maybe he can show us. Yeah, I don't. I don't know what pick. I. I mean that. That's a good one there. I mean, he that just because of that whole yeah, what he could bring. I think to yeah. I I do like Brian Thomas to the Jaguars. You know, there was a point this off season with Jacksonville where it was like, okay, guys, like what's the plan here? You haven't paid Josh Allen. You lost out on Calvin Ridley. You paid Gabe Davis a lot of money. You know, you you fired the defensive staff. Trevor Lawrence needs to take a step. What's going to help him take that step? There, a, a, a lot of uh, moving parts there. In addition to the backdrop of you're eight and three, and everything just completely fell apart, and you missed the playoffs. I think that they've recovered nicely. They did end up paying Josh Allen, the defensive end, obviously one of the best in the NFL. They they get the receiver in Brian Thomas uh, with Gabe Davis with Evan Ingram. With Christian Kirk. Now they did release Zay Jones yesterday, which man, with everything he's been through, it's uh pretty pretty low on the things he's been through. He'll he'll find a way to bounce back from it. Uh, but they're I think they're okay at receiver now. Defense has to take a step. Maybe maybe the new scheme can, can get them there, but I, I like them getting maybe the fourth best receiver in the draft. At 23, they kind of benefited from teams deciding to pick defensive players finally and a few linemen, and he slipped down the board. So we'll see. No draft grades from us. No grades. That's as much as you're going to get. Yeah, no, that, that, that's these drafts are, I feel like, uh, overanalyzed for sure. But I, I do like t- talking about these these players and their fits. I think that is part of the draft philosophy, which I, which is why I love being in the business. The fits 
the fits and the strategy of it are fun. Watching any NBA gym into these games? Oh, oh yes. Love it. Love, love NBA playoffs. Sixers, like, uh... Sixers Knicks right now is old school. Like as far as for old school, I talk about our age, older, just with those those battles in the Northeast Eastern Conference NBA playoffs. But no, I just the talent level is high. The game, you know, the games. There's always hits and misses playoff games. I, there's always that, but you get a good one. The talent level is high right now. Minnesota Denver should be a great series. Man, just casually kind of dipping into an NBA game here and there through this season. I was really, I, I the, the, the older I get, I, I realize I'm becoming old, like a curmudgeon. Michael Massey, one of our loyal readers here, he emailed me. He said, man, you're, you're pre curmudgeon right now. You're in the, you're in that stage, but I feel like that watching the NBA most of the season, like, man, there's no defense. Everybody's shooting threes. It's unwatchable. And then, you know, speaking of pre curmudgeon and then the commercial comes on, there's uh there's Howie Long shilling for Skechers slip on wide fit shoes. And I'm like, man, those look comfortable. And then, then I realized, wait a minute. I've been back down to my parents in Salamanca and my dad kind of loaned me up. I, he just had some extra Skechers and they were wide fit and they were slip ons. And what, not only that, but I, I, I took them and then I wear them all the time. Like they're really comfortable. <laughs> And I don't, I don't give a damn what people think. I really don't. I'm, I'm married with kids. Who am I trying to impress? Right? Like it's, that's fine. So yeah, give me the Skechers wide fit slip-ons, Howie. Great. Everybody out there listening. Maybe we should get him to, to sponsor a show or two because you know, I, I could use some more of those actually, but yeah, I feel, I feel like I'm becoming an aging bald. I've been bald for a while, you know, curmudgeon and watching it. And then you watch the Minnesota Timberwolves in the playoffs and they play defense they're feisty. Anthony Edwards is a rising star. He is a star. He is so fun to watch, just sticking it to Kevin Durant, who I got to think Durant is living with a little regret now. Like, why didn't I just stay in Golden State and win three more championships? He's been a uh, a mercenary in the NBA. But yeah, Anthony Edwards and Carl and Anthony Towns, Rudy Gobert, is it Jalen McDaniels, the defensive stopper? Mike, Mike Conley, you know, they've got a lot of pieces there. Denver's loaded. Denver's deep. Uh, Tempt to take Minnesota in that matchup. And that, the, the Thunder are fun. They're deep. They play defense. So it's, uh, I, I think basketball, like this is when basketball begins, right? Like West. if you're trying to watch a substantive basketball game, don't do it. One through 82. Tune in right now. 100%. Regular season's not worth it. And Tyler, let's just say go T-Wolves. Win that Western Conference. Wink, wink. Invested. Back in October, put that one in. In October? Yeah, odds are very nice. So how much can can we... Uh, is that another thing you don't ask anybody? Can, can no, we ask that? The, it, it was a crazy one. Yeah, these odds are like plus um, 3,800. And you threw down what, 100 bucks? That's where we have to stop. That's where we got to cut it off right there. That's where we, we stop. Got, but they got a little personal compared to what they are. I, got, I didn't even look today what they're at, though. I'm changing the subject. I don't even look today what they're at. Though. Yeah. That's what I don't know. You're a man. Anyway, you, you never ask hard. another man what he wagered. Never do that. Sorry. I crossed the line there, Jim. Got a little personal there for a second. I almost ask a woman her age. <laughs> are you pregnant too, Jim? Are you pregnant? No. No. Okay. All right, let's uh, let's sign off. I think I think we're good. Thanks everybody for listening. This was fun. Go along td.com for all stories. Hey, if you uh, if you want to know what the scouts think about any player that was drafted, Bob McGinn's nine part series is up there. Check it out. You'll get the uh, the good, the bad, the ugly. Hey, Chris Ballard's not going to like it. He'll probably complain about it in a press conference. But what can you do? You know, nobody's going to like it, right? Because then everybody celebrates all oh, these damn anonymous scouts. Screw them. Put your name. Guess what? Bob's been doing that. This is his 40th series. He's developed these relationships. He's got his filter. He knows who he can trust. He's bringing you exactly how the NFL feels. 
Adani Mitchell doesn't fall to 52 because the big meanies, the scouts, had some mean things to say. No, like Bob is bringing you the reflection of how these NFL teams view the prospects, which is why a guy like that may fall. Okay, I got to stop. But yes, if there's a player that was drafted and you want to learn about him, check it out. It's there. And we're going to have more. I'm chipping away at a series right now that's taking a little time, Jim. So um haven't been cranking out the day-to-day columns. Feel the readers. Uh, I got to take a little time on this one. So we'll we'll put that out soon. And yes, I want to do another live event because that was a lot of fun at Fatty in Hamburg recently. So we'll, we'll do that again. We'll get get the whole gang out there. Ryan Mira in the house, James, Don, great crew, Ravi, right? Jeremy White, Skursky, Matt Fairburn. We'll do that again. Thanks so much, everyone.